There we go. <laughs> All right, we're back. We got it. We got it working. Um, you'd think after uh, however many of these we've done, I would have worked it out, but unfortunately not. And that's all part of the uh, the show, the ordeal. Um, but first, welcome, welcome wherever you may be tuning in from uh, across Australia. If you've joined us in the Zoom chat, if you are watching on Facebook, YouTube, the oakbarrel.com.au slash live, wherever it's, you've come from, um, welcome to tonight's virtual tasting. Um, a very, very, very different setting to what uh, you may have experienced here at the Oak Barrel uh, probably over about 10 months ago, um, where we did have a, quite a lovely tasting room on the side of the store here, lots of tables, lots of beautiful wines that we could have poured you in the night. Unfortunately, due to the uh, events that, that have transpired here this year, it's left us unable to, to run these amazing tastings, which we used to um, all those months ago and, and, and open amazing wines try delicious products and, and chat and, and have a good time amongst us. Um, but uh, due to those, due to that happening, we, um, we sort of jumped at it and, and decided that, you know, we wanted to keep doing this. We wanted to keep bringing amazing wines in front of you and your glass and then trying those along. So we did um, build uh, this, this uh, space, this virtual space, if you will, to, to, to come forward to you in, in your lounge rooms and your, your bedrooms or wherever you're watching um, and hopefully share some amazing drinks as well. And, and I feel like we have done, whether it's whiskey, wine, gin, Armagnac, wine, um, we've done a lot of this. Um, but I think that I know definitely in the, the tastings that I've run in the uh, here in a virtual space, um, there's kind of been one that's that's always been coming into my, my email inbox and it's do a Georgian one, do a Georgian one. Hey, Joe, when are you going to do a Georgian one? Um, and I can comfortably sit here and say that I am absolutely not in any way equipped to run a Georgian wine tasting on my own in a virtual space for the Oak Barrel, um, which is where the man to my left um, comes in. Uh, and we've known each other for a number of years now, Absolutely, I think. Yeah. And we've, um, I've, I've, I fell in love with Georgian wine probably the first time I ever tasted it when you would have poured it probably across my desk. Um, and the it was almost a life changing experience just just in that to see um, not only wine that I never uh, from a country that I never tried before but uh, just a degree of flavors and a degree of versatility and and uh, a range of, of varietals that I didn't know but I also couldn't pronounce at the time um, and from from that moment all those years ago I, I sort of found myself constantly trying to dive down the rabbit hole and. And learn as much as I could, and 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 study up as much as I could. And I mean, you probably know it's it's quite a hard thing to do on the internet <laughs> to learn, learn yeah, about yeah. these Georgian wines. Um, There's actually not that much information out there. No, no, it's it's impossible. Which is why I was really really excited to make tonight happen, um, and to get Tim sitting here next to me. Um, and those that have tuned in before probably noticed it's a, a little bit of a different setup. And one I'm quite fond of is is maybe not the the split screens and the 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 jagged talking, but uh hopefully a really, really cool little discussion with yeah, two absolutely. very, very exciting wines. Uh, but Tim, welcome, mate. Thanks for, Thank thanks you, for coming thanks, down. Thanks for having me back. So yeah, um, uh, it is, you know, it is a shame not to have uh, have everyone here live. But the beauty of that is, is that, you know, we've got much larger geographical reach tonight. So we've got you know, friends outside of the usual Sydney customers um, who can who can join us. So welcome. So I guess it's it's pretty fair to say, and, and I, I know it quite well, but um, you are sort of the guy to go to for Georgian wine here in Australia. I think every time I have a question, I'm, I'm the one to, to pick up the phone. And... I think that's a, it's only by default. I think I'm the only guy. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's why. Um, every time I have a, a question, uh, which is a lot of the time, I, I generally pick up the phone and, and come forward and, and say, hey, what does this mean? Or what does this word mean? Or where does where is this in, in, in the, the country of Georgia, um, which fascinates me. But also, I, I guess the way I wanted to go is we do have two wines here that we're going to try tonight, uh, an amber, as you can sort of see in our glasses here. And I encourage anybody that does have the wines um, there in the room to, to pull those corks and, and, and drink along with us. Um, but I guess to, to, to the jump right back to the beginning, how did it all start? I mean, what, what sort of inspires someone like yourself to, to um, well, how did you find these wines, and then um, all of a sudden think, "Wow, this is you know, this is amazing." A pretty interesting story. I mean, it came came through the industry generally. It actually came through um, tasting the wines of, of Pheasants Tears. Initially, I had a, a good mate in Melbourne. Um, there was a, a restaurant, actually sadly ill lived, restaurant on Flinders Lane in the city, just next to, well, almost next to Cumulus, called Virginia Plain. 
um, and great restaurant. They had, you know, for one of the first times in Melbourne, definitely they had a natural, a completely natural wine list. So um, that was pretty, and they were kind of well ahead of where the current market trend is at the moment. Um, and Raul had been to, I think it was Raw or Real Wine, um, one of the two natural wine festivals that happen annually in London uh, and had met um, John Werderman from Pheasant's Tears, the US um, expat who is, um, is, is half of Pheasant's Tears. And they'd struck up a little relationship and Raul had actually air freighted in some bottles of Pheasant's Tears um, and they would have been the first Georgian wines to ever be imported, I would think, into Australia. Certainly the first um, traditional natural Georgian wines, which is what we now import um, in into the country. He brought them in just for the wine list. So, and I went in for um, to see him. My brother was also good friends with him, who's, who's Nick Stock in, in in the wine industry. So, um, and he just kind of poured a poured a range of these wines, and you know, tried a few orange wines before, but they hadn't really sort of impressed me. And then when I tried these, um, it was just the next level. It was a real kind of light bulb moment went on, and. Just the, they're incredibly soulful and um, uh, and there's this, this, they're so mysterious and they're kind of I mean they're exactly like Georgia the country itself when you visit Georgia um, they they are exactly like the wines they're, they're so they're so deep and re they resonate so deeply with you know with the sort of more I mean you know almost kind of spiritual aspects of um, of of culture um, and that's the yeah, that's that's something which really entranced me. So what happened was then that Virginia Plain uh, closed, as I said, um, and, uh, you know, Raul had mentioned to me that John was interested to find an importer for Australia and tried the wines. And, and when you read the story of, you know, John Werderman slash Pheasant's Tears in, in Georgia, you know, it reads like a bit of a fairy tale. It's pretty enticing. And, it's, um, you know, and, and you've got the history of Georgian wine, 8,000 years as the background to it. So it was just kind of, yeah. It just sounded amazing, and in terms of <clears throat> you know that search that a lot of us have for for you know real wine or authenticity, you know, well within any product, I mean, you know, whiskey's a classic, classic um, point in case, you know, provenance and authenticity. Um, this was the pinnacle of anything that I'd, I'd ever seen. So, so I got chatting with John, and um, uh, yeah, we we sort of hooked up, and he. He did a small shipment of pheasant's tears um, for us to start with, and then um, you know, being one of the originals and, and obviously very well networked in what, what is essentially a pretty small scene anyway within Georgia, because especially when I started working, you know, maybe six years ago or so, it was still still the very beginnings of the Renaissance, and it's flourishing now beautifully, which is great. More and more, um, you know, younger winemakers and smaller producers coming in every year to this um, to this niche. But John helped, um, you know, set up a, a little portfolio um, for us, and we've kind of grown from there. And now we've got we've got actually an ex uh, ex um, Venus employee who was working in Melbourne came to <laughs> came to Georgia with us one year on the trip. Met a Georgian girl, and he now lives in Georgia. Yeah, um, right. so uh, he's on the ground for us, and it's it's great. We're just in a fantastic position to you know, and I think you know, in terms of our offering, um, okay, yeah, we're the only guys doing it in Australia, but in terms of any importers around the world, we've got the biggest portfolio of, of, you know, of natural producers. And, and we've now got, after a number of years, all the sort of traditional regions of winemaking covered um, in, you know, that, that we wanted to cover. So it's taken a while to get that. Um, so yeah, we, we're pretty excited to, to be able to offer this. Um, and we're only having a look at two wines tonight, but it's a, it's a good, good introduction to some to some very classic styles. I feel like, and I will probably touch on quite a lot over the next hour or so, but I mean, what gets me every time about Georgia and every time I open up a book or look at a webpage or whatever is like, the history is like mind blowing to the point where we've barely scratched the surface here in Australia and even most of, um, you know, most of the classic European wine regions still don't even come close. Was that something that you sort of, were aware of at the time of tasting these air freighted samples of pheasant's tears or uh yeah i mean it was when i read the story i mean i never kind of you know i'd only traveled to, to western europe before mm. going to georgia but um i, I didn't really understand it completely until i sort of visited georgia and john actually took me on you know to some of these kind of ancient sites and you know we, i just saw kind of how much ancient culture there is that's still you know still within reach in georgia it's you know you can go places everywhere and it just exists it's not 
roped off or um, you know or you know sort of protected or shut off from the public like it is in Western Europe where um, you know where it's much more developed. Uh, it's it's just part of the everyday. So mm. it's 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 amazing to to visit somewhere like that. So I mean, I, I never I never did history at school, so I never had a I never had a real you know passion or, or love for it. But um, I have a profound respect for it. That's mm. for sure. Mm. And and it's quite humbling to go somewhere like Georgia. And also, you know, if you do read a little bit of the history and you know where it sits in you know the meeting of basically you know, you know it's Europe and and the Middle East, it's East meets West. It's you know very important. Um, uh, place on that on that traditional Silk Route, uh, and it's you know it's been it's a country that's been occupied by every major civilization that has existed within their region over you know however many thousands of years the last thousands of years, uh, and still their culture has survived and their you know their culture of of the vine has survived as well. So I mean you know. We, holidaying in Western Europe, like many of us have, you know, and you go to regions like Italy and France, there's a vineyard everywhere. And, uh, you know, every, uh, every region's got their different varieties and their different food and whatever. And you're like, wow, you know, wine is just such an amazing part of their life, every day of life. And you go to Georgia and it's not just part of their everyday life. It's their religion. It's part of their religion. Um, I mean, they're, they're very strong um, orthodoxy religion, first kingdom in the world um, to, um, to adopt Christianity, kingdom wide, in the third century, um, and since then, it's you know the the yeah, Christianity and and the vine have been inseparable. So it's all through religious iconography in their you know in their ancient churches, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, and their fables, their stories. Yeah, yeah, and it's, I, it's it's really you know it's it's a very profound experience for someone who's who's you know for me, I'm deeply into wine. You know, wine is is cultural for me. It's not just you know a way to um, you know, a way to um, enjoy myself or, or to make a living. It's, mm. it's it's much more than that. So you know, so Georgia is obviously something which has really resonated deeply. Yeah, I, 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 it, it seems like that. I mean, I, I've never been, but hopefully we'll we'll get there one day. But, one day, we yeah, can. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> so. definitely. Um, but it, it it seems like it's just from what I can make out, and it, I suppose it's quite similar in other European countries as well. But that difference of, like you said, it's just ingrained in that that lifestyle to the point where most. Georgians will make wine in the, for the family and then that kind of thing. And That's it. I mean, it's, you know, we, we kind of think, uh, well, you know, in a fairly Anglo society, you know, we look at sort of other cultures that come to Australia and have a tradition of making wine at home and, you know, in the garage, bathtubs, whatever, you know, whatever stories you've heard. Um, but in, in Georgia, yeah, every single family, um, you know, that has land outside the city, which would be virtually everyone, mm. makes wine. They all have a little pot of vines. And instead of having a, a cellar below the house full of bottles, they actually have a little Marani. Mm. which is basically just, you know, is, is the earthen floor and buried beneath that are the quivery, which are these traditional um, amphora-shaped uh, vessels and clay terracotta vessels. Mm. Um, and that's, yeah, that's every family makes a little bit of wine. So everyone's a winemaker in Georgia. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty fascinating. I, I think the other thing that I sort of have the most admiration for out of your portfolio and what you bring in is that um, I feel like each producer has, you know, obviously a fascinating story, um, and here, you know, we're going through this big wave of, of natural winemaking and, and yeah. obviously low chemical additives and um, sustainable organic biodynamic farming is um, well, a very hot talking point and that people do a lot of that in Australia. It sort of seems as though that's just kind of how it is for, for a lot of the producers that you bring in. There's no fad or, or coolness or anything like that. It's That's been day dot. Look, that's, that's how the wine was made. That, that's, a, that's another thing mm. that's, you know, that... that I mean, is attractive to work with these wines for because, yeah, in, in the natural wine world, you're right, there's a lot of fad and fashion. Um, and I know that as an importer and even not just natural wine, but just, you know, in the market generally, um, you know, you bring something in and everyone jumps on it because it's new and they love it and it's amazing. And you bring it in the next year and then it's not quite as popular, even though, you know, even though you've bought three times as much in. Um, uh, so, yeah, it, it's, it's interesting. And the, I think it's, I mean, it's in tune with society today, isn't it? You know, we live a fairly short cycle of, you know, of what's interesting to us. You know, we've got incredible amounts of stimulation. So we tend to churn through things that we enjoy, that we like quite quickly. I think natural wine, you know, is a classic case in point of that. So it's, you know, it's sort of, it's not, not the whole category, but, um, you know, new wines are hot, people jump on it and then they want the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. 
with the Georgian thing, um, you know, I can see that there's part of that appeal for people discovering for the first time, but how this is different is that this has been done for at least 8,000 years this way. This is not something that is fad or fashion. It's not something which is going to come and go as well. Um, yes, it is a renaissance of this traditional winemaking style, um, you know, being rebirthed after the breakdown of the USSR and as Georgia's open to the rest of the world and as the natural wine world has discovered, you know, the, you know, the, these you know, very authentic styles of ancient winemaking. Um, so yeah, I, I'm I'm fairly confident that um, you know these wines warrant a place which sits aside uniquely from you know oh it's natural wine mm -hmm. uh, oh, it's the you know the ancient natural wine it's just ancient wine and you know we you know we, we'd love to see you know much like you guys you know you have you don't just have one um, one bottle you actually have you know a range you get behind it and the same with restaurants as well good gastronomic restaurants getting behind the wines and having a good representation, which is why we've, you know, we've got such a huge portfolio, not you know, huge in terms of volume of bottles, but in terms of the, the spread that we have, it's really important. We've got a lot of choice for people, I think. So that, you know, so that people can have a range. They can tell more of a story, more of a story than perhaps, you know, we're telling a very sort of small story, but it's the, it's the story where to start yeah, yeah. tonight. Mm. Yeah, for sure, with these two wines. I think so, yeah. I think we're like first tasting these, um, just the, the range of Georgian wines and uh, with the, the small restaurant background I have is that, um, you know, I have a lot of fun selling these here at, at the Oak Barrel um, purely because of they're I think not designed with specific foods in mind, but with all foods in mind across, across nearly, nearly all the wines. I get what we'll try um, right now. And, and, and a few others is that they're, they're incredibly gastronomically versatile wines yeah. that I think are built for almost all times of day. And, uh, yeah, utterly drinkable, um, which I think is cool. Um, but I mean, we've probably, you know, gave our gave our feelings a little bit about, about Georgia there. The first wine that we do have tonight, though, sure. we're definitely fans. Um, is uh, which everyone will probably have at home is the Pheasants Tears uh, Chinuri Seventeen, which which we yep. sent out. Which, uh, like Tim said a little bit earlier, was uh, well, John was was sort of the the catalyst of of this whole thing, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. So, um, and this is, yeah, this is probably one of the first wines that we've, we've imported this, this style um, and, and this variety as well. So, um, so just kind of talking a little bit about the wine. Um, this is from one of the vineyards outside of the Pheasants Tears home region, Kakheti. So this is in Kartli, which is considered to be central Georgia for, for winemaking purposes. Um, so it's more kind of closer to the capital of, um, of Iblisi. So Chinuri, the variety, um, it comes from an old Georgian text. The name comes from an old Georgian text, meaning uh, from chi, the word chini, which means kind of greenish yellow. So um, it turns out that a lot of Georgian varieties, given that they're very, very ancient, were named after the color of berries when they were ripe, um, or, or parts of the vine, that kind of stuff. So yeah, for, um, we, we're going to spin up the little map here so you can see the see the region. So um, sort of you've got inner Kartli and lower Kartli there, that's sort of one area. Um, in Lower Kartli, you'll find um, to be easy, the, the capital. So this is from um, uh, an area called Makrani, which is quite famous. You know, I think it features traditionally in sort of royal winemaking. Um, you know, sort of many hundreds of years ago, uh, it was one of the one of the favoured regions. So today, this variety, uh, through the Soviet era, it was favoured for uh, sparkling winemaking. So it was one of the sort of seven or so of the five hundred and twenty-five. Uh, recorded endemic varieties that were, were permitted for commercial production during the Soviet era. Um, so yeah. so there's, there's a little bit of it around as a result of that. Um, and certainly it's um, a lot of people in the sort of, you know, conventional uh, industry in Georgia make, you know, traditional style sparkling mm. wines out of it. Um, we've got sparkling pet nap from one producer out of it, which is quite good, <laughs> but it tends to be, you know, it's fresh herbal or white fruit, uh, if, if made like a white wine, mm -hmm. um, more delicate in that sort of, you know, pear and citrus um, kind of style. Then here, obviously, we've got an amber version of it. Uh, this is one month with maceration of not just skins, but also stems. So there is a difference in some producers like to retain the stems. Retaining the stems gives you a lot more structure. Um, it, it does, you know, it does bring out a, a, a lot more tannin um, and obviously makes the wine, you know, a little bit sort of sappier. Mm. Something we're familiar with in Australian red wines when they do a whole bunch as well, we get that sappiness. The same thing happens here with, with the white varieties. Yeah, absolutely. So this, so you, this is the it's just straight one hundred percent Chinuri 
about a month on skins. Yeah, so a month um, on skins, and then yeah. after that month, um, so the clear wine, so the, the all the all the skins, stems, etc., will settle to the bottom. On top of that, um, would have settled the the actual wine leaves as well after fermentation. So that's all sealed away in the in the tip of the quivery. So basically, um, the wine is kind of you know the the wine is still circulating uh, as you get this kind of natural vortex of that egg shape. Um, but in the tip, you've actually got locked away from that vortex and it's not part of it, is, is all the sort of solids from fermentation. So, so um, after, you know, after fermentation finishes, there's not a great deal of extra extraction. Hmm. Uh, and then so, um, and the wine settles quite clear. So they, they just basically uh, rack that off into another quivery and will age it again for another sort of six to seven months as, as clear wine. Okay, right, right. Yeah. And then, then it'll, it'll come out and, and, and be bottled. I mean, yeah, just immediately that that nose, it, like the what the monster, you know, jump out. It's it's um, lots of dried fruit. I think we might have might have been live talking about earlier, but that yeah, some dried um, yellow apricots. Yeah, um, you know, so I sort of sometimes say like old fruit bowl. You know, you kind of walk mm. past that fruit bowl and there's a there's an orange in there that you know is starting to turn on the underside. I know that yeah. doesn't sound amazing in terms of <laughs> or it's that attractive in terms of descriptor for wine, but it's, yeah, it, it's kind of a thing. And also, you know, not really nutty, but maybe sort of starting to head into the nuts, but more the sort of meals and, you know, fresh nut paste. Yeah, I get that, that, that sort of that, that nut, um, yeah, nut paste I think is really good, but it just has this really lovely, you know, orange fruit bouquet that, isn't necessarily super super fresh, but it still has a lot of intensity and, and roundness to it. There's definitely a lot of fruit there, but mm. it's it's not just primary fruit. You know, it's, mm. it's secondary and, and and tertiary fruits. You know, it's mm. the dried mm. fruits. It's the it's sort of the cooked fruits as well. But yeah. Um, but then on the palate, you know, there's a really there's a nice tang to it. You know, and this and this is wild. You know, there's acidity both natural and mm. and volatile here. Um, but yeah, there's really lovely sort of juicy long and, and very dry you can see why yeah. it's used for sparkling wine this variety um yeah very kind of dry pithy orange fruits yeah 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 that, that pithy that that's that skin kind of note is there um a few things you, you touched on there um but i suppose the first one is, is john himself has a pretty unique story which i think i've heard once or twice but yeah, yeah. um you want, you want to hear it? You're yeah, up, yeah, up, I, I, just, I think it's awesome. Uh, well, yeah, the, the story of John Wordman Pheasant's Tears Camp of is, is pretty amazing. So, so John comes from a sort of artistic family in the, in, in the US and um, I think was always destined to be an artist himself. Um, when he was 15, uh, he went into sort of the local, well, would have been CD shop at, at that time, at his age, um, and was in, you know, sort of rumbling around the world music section. There wasn't much on offer, but he found this, um, CD of Georgian traditional polyphonic music um, by a troupe called um, Tadeshi. And um, he bought it and took it home and was kind of, uh, I, if you've heard this polyphonic music before, it's, it's, it's weird. I mean, it's kind of, I think maybe the most mainstream thing you can liken it to is, um, you know, Gregorian chanting, um, but it's, it's this layering and it's deeply soulful and very resonant, um, much like the wines, actually. <laughs> Um, pretty intense at the same time, much like the wines as well. But um, it, yeah, John was really beguiled by this and kind of, uh, and then he started reading about Georgia. There weren't a lot of books available um, in the in his part of the US to read, but he sort of devoured what he could and, um, um, and always kind of had this background love for Georgia. So he, he went off to art school uh, and then sort of his philosophy with art developed. I mean, he's quite traditional sort of painter, um, not a traditional guy, but um, he believes that, you know, tradition preserves creativity. And then he wanted to find a school to sort of finish his studies that um, reflected that. So he found a school in Russia and went went over there and, um, and studied for a few years there um, and had a Georgian and an old lady who was a, um, a Georgian native was his neighbor. So um, she's actually given Georgian lessons. So um, he was studying there and he decided to do his, you know, his thesis or his last, you know, main piece of his fine art degree in Georgia. Um, so organised to go over there um, in, I think it was 1996. Uh, and, you know, as is a custom of when you arrive in Georgia, you're sort of picked up and, you know, you're straight off to some kind of feast or supra. Well, supra is, is the Georgian feast and um, at a local restaurant. So George was taken, um, George, John was taken off there. 
and um, usual thing, copious amounts of wine and food mm. and the, the tomato, the host um, who does, you know, runs all the toasts and, and the poetry of the meal, et cetera. There's, there's a lot of, lot of talking and, um, and uh, it, it's actually quite, quite beautiful, a lot of the toast. It's not the usual, um, you know, stuff that we're used to or the anglicised things that we're used to. It's, it's all about, you know, family and friends and love and, uh, it's, yeah, it's all, it's all quite, quite personal. Mm. Anyway, um, at the end of the meal, the tomato, or towards the end of the meal, the tomato introduces the, um, you know, the, the troupe who are going to play the music um, for the rest of the evening or afternoon, whatever it was. And it turns out that it was the same troupe of folk singers okay, right. and, and the band who were on the CD that John bought when he was 15 in the US. Wow. So, yeah, it's pretty amazing coincidence. He actually knew them all by name because he, he loved the CD, studied it. And, and could speak Georgian by this time. So he addressed them all in Georgian to, mm. to sort of their amazement. So um, it actually turns it turns out that he then went on to marry Ketavan, who's the who was the lead singer um, uh, of the troupe and, and probably the most respected um, you know, folk singer in, in Georgia of this traditional polyphonic music. So it, to, together they actually started a project of preserving the traditional um, polyphonic songs of Georgia. So they got a, I'm assuming it's some sort of grant, um, cultural grant, travelled around the country. They spent two years and they catalogued over 2,000 different songs which now exist in an archive um, in, uh, in Tbilisi in the capital in Georgia. So they did some amazing work with it. So, yeah, so John, um, John bought a house there in 1997. I think, I can't remember when, when the Civil War, which was post-USSR breaking up, finished, but I think... I think John sort of went back to Russia and kind of had to wait for the dust to settle a little bit, mm. and then uh, bought this uh, bought a place in Signaki, beautiful Signaki, beautiful hilltop town in Kakheti, which is the, the sort of main wine growing region, and and that's today where the Pheasants Tears Cellar Door is based. Not his house, but mm. it's based in this in this beautiful town, and um, you know a, a lot of visitors will will go through this town. So if you do make it to Georgia, it's um, it's probably somewhere you will visit, um, and he yeah, so he eventually moved there in 1998. Um, and you know he'd done this work, and uh, and then many years later he was out painting. I think it was 2006. Uh, he was out painting in, in one of the vineyards, you know, doing one of his fairly traditional you know landscapes that he does. And uh, someone rolled up next to him on a you know noisy old post-Soviet or no, noisy old Soviet tractor while he's trying to you know do a beautiful fine art painting, <laughs> and and was sort of yelling at him over the top of the truck to, oh, I've heard about all this, all the work you did with the traditional polyphonic music. You know, I've got a proposition. You need to come to my house. You know, I, we need to have, we need to have dinner. You know, And John's like, well, you know, be, be, be busy now. And <laughs> do you mind turning your tractor off? But no, I can't turn the tractor off. There's no starter motor and I'm on the flat. So I have to, I have to, anyway, I'll keep going. I'll speak to you later. <laughs> so anyway, this, this, Gentleman on the tractor, you know, John took a rain check, obviously, and the gentleman on the tractor, you know, was persistent. Um, he tracked John down for a, for a reason and, um, and over the coming weeks sort of reminded him of the invitation and eventually John took it up and went over to, um, to Geller's place, um, Geller and Palishvili, uh, who was a, you know, traditional, from a traditional vineyard family of the area. And, and, you know, Geller, when he got him over for dinner, implored him and said, John, you, uh, you and your wife have done this amazing work preserving uh, the polyphonic music of Georgia. Nothing's being done for these traditional Georgian varieties. And many of them only exist now after the Soviet era in people's backyards. They're not cultivated commercially and they're at grave risk of being completely lost forever. You know, uh, we need to do something about it. So. So I think over the course of a very long evening and uh, you know, at some stage in the early hours um, and after many bottles of wine, as it always is custom in Georgia, yeah. Um, the, yeah, the idea of Pheasant's Tears was born and the, the raison d'etre for Pheasant's Tears was to preserve these, you know, these endemic varieties mm. of which there's 525 on record. So um, Pheasant's Tears today actually are really fortunate. They've got one of a, a, a set of a very few I think there's maybe three that exist in Georgia of library vineyards. So mm. in, within one hectare, they've got 417 um, traditional endemic varieties planted. So um, they actually make a wine from it too, which is the Georgian. The uh, yeah, Polyphonia. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. It's also available yeah. here. Um, oh, you've got some. Wow, we got some here. Yeah, yeah. We, we completely sold out. So well done. Um, that's like, that's the one, not only that, that, that they've been making wine for 6,000 years or 8,000 years back to 6,000 BC. Yeah. But also just the pure 
amount of native varieties to this country which it's is just, still relatively yeah. unknown it, it, it's mind-boggling well, this is the part of the world you know sort of here georgia armenia this is where you know the vine was literally taken out of mm. the forest i mean it is a vine it traditionally grows up trees mm. and there's still examples actually there's um and there's, there's one producer who makes a few buckets of wine every year and it's from 350 400 year old vines which are you know massive thick vines that are growing up through the forest and he climbs up you know to the very top and, <laughs> and harvests whatever small crop they actually yield um, but it was here that, yeah, um, you know, that was taken out. It was ne Neanderthalic man essentially um, cultivated the, the vine and started farming mm. it. Um, and, you know, the, yeah, so this, this is where the 8,000 years comes from, is mm. within an old, um, an old village, you know, Neolithic village, there's, um, you know, it's grape seeds, Venus vinifera grape seeds, vinifera grape seeds, sorry, um, which are, you know, the varieties, that's the species we work with today for all our, all our winemaking varieties. Um, so they, they've been found and carbon dated and they're 8,000 years old. So, I mean, it's, and that's a fairly civilized situation. So mm. there's a fairly good chance the history is a mm. lot Much older, older than that. Yeah, but, wow. but we just have carbon dating proof so far. That's unreal. Yeah, far back. yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, it's amazing. I mean, you, and you kind of tell that, you know, it's like, and people think, oh, you know, why not? Oh, yeah, yeah, mm. you know. Western Europe, that's where it all sort of started and happened. And no, it's not. Yeah, that yeah, was yeah. a lot later. Yeah. You know, the Romans brought the vine there. Um, and even the Romans, you know, yeah, mm. and, and the Greeks. I mean, they, you know, they came from Georgia. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's that's, little, that's fascinating. Um, I feel like this is such an intriguing wine. And the, the one um, thing that I did want to um, also touch on, which I believe both these wines go through what we touched on a little bit earlier, but the, the quavery ferment or quavery ferment and aging. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, which... If I've done this right, looks a bit like this. Looks a little bit like yeah. this. So the, these are examples which are not um, not in use. Obviously, they're just probably waiting to be uh, to be buried. So the Georgian cellar set up. Do you want me to just kind of talk about that? Quickly? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. But so it's, it's just popped up now. But yeah. these are the. So yeah. I mean, within Georgia, they make wine like you know, like we do in you know big stainless steel tank farms in in uh, in our big regions, etc. That's the majority of the wine they make. This traditional style of winemaking is a style which is, as we've just been talking about, is, you know, is 8,000 years old at least. Um, it's the style of, of what everyone, this is how everyone makes wine at home. Um, so they have these vessels called quevery. They range, you know, they can be sort of tiny little things that people are making literally under their houses um, or, you know, big sort of 2,000 litres. Um, I think in the past they found ancient quevery to be 10,000 litres. So this is... So some, someone's made a terracotta vessel that's 10,000 litres, that holds 10,000 litres. That's a massive achievement in itself. Well, um, I, I've been in probably wineries made. that couldn't even fit a 10,000 litre tank. tank yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like... Me also, me also. But it's, it's um, this beautiful ancient vessel and it's now, um, it's, it's, it's on, it's the vessel itself, which is on the um, UNESCO um, sort of world heritage for intangible assets or something like that. So it's, you know, it, it's globally recognized for its cultural significance, this, this ancient style of, of winemaking, but it wouldn't have just been winemaking in the ancient days. It would have been just general preservation. I mean, no refrigerators. Um, so uh, the earth was people's refrigerators. So they would bury, um, you know, in terracotta pots, because obviously it's, it's safe to put in this relatively safe to put them in soil, but they would bury, you know, grains, um, you know, wet foods, fermented foods, and obviously wine um, was another thing that, that would be buried and, and made this way. So it's um, it, it's, a, it's a continuous continuous style of winemaking technology that's been running for, you know, for a very, very long time. Um, it's all below ground. So when you visit a Georgian cellar, which is called a Morani, um, you won't find sort of, you know, oh, here's what we do in the earth and here's, you know, here's all the tanks and this is what we do. You know, it's, it's not, there's nothing. It's quite... It's quite confronting, you know, for someone who's used to going to a winery. It's like, where's, where, where do you make the wine? Yeah, like, yeah. There we make the wine. Literally everything is done in the quiver. So this, it's, it's very, um, yeah, this, I guess there's very little modernity employed mm. to it. it if people that do it seriously really do do it in, in quite an ancient, ancient fashion still. Uh, and it's, it's an incredibly difficult way to work because these are, sealed vessels with um you know with small openings that are buried in the earth and they're not i mean some people you know oh, you bury them in the earth that's right and and they don't actually sort of calculate that no they're buried permanently in the earth mm. you don't dig them up every year and then 
you know, put them on a forklift and, and move them around. It's they are buried there forever, um, and they're, they're very difficult to to excavate. I mean, obviously, you know, they're very fragile um, to start with, but as they get older, they're even more fragile. That said, pheasant is actually they do have in their original Marani, they do have some two hundred plus year old quivery, which they you know, which they have rescued, I think, from from monasteries. Mm. Um, so uh, you know, there, there were lots of quivery around. Um, uh, unfortunately, the yeah, the Soviets tend to use them for things like diesel storage yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, during during their reign. So, um, which of course completely um, ruins them. Yeah, but so uh, the winemaking itself is is pretty simple uh, in the traditional sense. You know, we could say both these wines are traditional. Probably the the, the amber wine is the more traditional, mm. but uh, it was a case that they would have um, a, a, a large, very large hollowed log, sort of actually hollowed into like a square fashion. Which they basically move over to the um the top of the quivery and the grapes are just brought in as whole bunch poured in there and people would squash them i mean much like we've seen you know people you know whether it's portugal or you know france or italy you know stomping grapes and sort of you know holding each other and, and having a good time so basically crushing everything and then at the uh, one end of that um that hollowed out log there's a shoot which which is what's sitting over the top of the quivery opening the quivery and everything basically just gets sort of sloshed down into the quivery that way so it's all kind of um, squashed and then it goes through i think what i you know described before it goes through a natural um, natural fermentation um and then would be if it's left for maceration would be topped up with other wine once it's finished um the thing is you can't fill the wine full of quivery because i uh, can't fill the quivery full of wine mm. because obviously as it starts to ferment with the energy and the gas and the heat the cat rises and it'll, it'll you know you'll have a volcano on your hands mm. before too long so so, um, so that, that's a bit of a fine art in itself, particularly as it narrows towards the top um, with the cat pushing up. But post-fermentation, everything settled down, it's topped up, and then um, traditionally it's sealed up. So uh, people would use um, stones, they would use wood in the old days. Today, most people will use a piece of glass and, and across the, the very sort of top of the, uh, the rim of the quivery opening, um, you know, it's clay or maybe sort of a modern winemaking putty that's used today to try and sort of hermetically seal it when you push the seal down. Uh, and in the old days, and I've still got actual producers that work, quite, quite a few producers that work this way, the Marani was outside. There wasn't even, you know, a lean-to over the top, so it's in the vineyard. And in the old days, they would, um, they would then sometimes actually close the quivery, not with anything except clay, just a big, yeah, right. like a big sort of, you know, say four-inch... Um, piece of clay will just sit over the top and completely seal it. Uh, and yeah, you know, I've still got producers working with sort of outside Marani. And then it's, yes, yeah, it's, it's left for a period of time. I think historically it's probably, um, you know, and being deeply um, religious and with the Christian calendar, the wines were probably left until Easter uh, and then um, and then opened for, for supers at Easter you know, for, the, for the first time. But of course they would have been open traditionally for other occasions, you know, weddings, significant village occasions there's um you know there's a great pride amongst you know actually you know being the person that supplies the best wine for you know for, for a certain super and um and the way these wines are consumed particularly the amber wines is they're not they're not like we do a dinner where we have a series of different bottles and we, yeah, yeah we have a progression of styles over dinner that doesn't work that way so it's one wine uh, and it goes with everything so you know i mean traditionally it would come in bulk it wouldn't even it wouldn't be bottled um, that's not to say that it wasn't good quality. It just wasn't the, you know, the, there wasn't the need to, to bottle it. It wasn't mm. traveling kind of beyond the local village, really. Um, so it's quite interesting that a lot of people that I work with now have been making these styles of wine in small amounts for a lot longer than they've been bottling it. Um, and they've been known locally for the quality of their wine. Mm. Um, uh, but yeah, the, it's it's never been able to travel because it's not been bottled. So part of the renaissance of this uh, that's been happening in Georgia is actually is these these old timers putting wine in bottle for the first time, and all of a sudden it pops up here in Sydney, Australia. That's pretty At cool. The Ocarrel, of course. <laughs> yeah. well, I um, I, I it, like it's still even today. I still find myself pretty gobsmacked by how amazing that sort of thing is. And one thing I, I noticed is that probably even before they really understood it, but well, maybe they did understand at the time, but I think by having it in the ground um, actually helped uh, maintain a more constant temperature. Yeah, so it does. So, yeah, so during fermentation, obviously there's a buildup of heat, as I said, mm. um, and 
the, the earth actually will draw some of that heat away, mm. um, but it also provides a nice constant temperature. You know, we have you know, classic examples in, in Europe in wine cellars that are very, very cold in winter where, you know, the malolactic fermentation or even the primary fermentation mm. stops over winter. Mm. But the sort of constant temperature of the earth, um, uh, you know, during winter, it's actually warmer in the earth than it is outside, allows, you know, the fermentations to complete themselves mm. or the malolactic fermentation, the secondary fermentation to, to go through to go through and then it's a nice constant temperature after that so mm. looking at 11 or 14 degrees or whatever it is so that's you know that's that's pretty good temperature for wine as we know from having our own cellars that you know that's kind of an ideal mm -hmm. temperature for keeping bottled, bottled stock so it's it's no different for for wine kept in you know in, in bulk as well yeah yeah in the quivery so that is so awesome. the interesting thing with the quivery the, the vessel itself so i mean obviously it's you know terracotta clay vessel it has to be fired uh, after it's fired, as it cools down, it gets to a certain temperature where it's um, it's no longer too hot, um, but still warm. Uh, molten beeswax will actually be taken to sort of an old mop head or whatever will um, will be brushed inside, sort of very thinly, not to seal the vessel. Where a lot of people think that it's like oh, it's sealed by beeswax. It's not actually sealed. The idea is that um, this this warm terracotta has a sort of sponge-like quality and absorbs the molten beeswax so that all the pores, all the little cavities inside the inside the wall um, of the quivery are actually filled with the beeswax. So it's just a, it's something they actually do for um, for cleanliness. So it makes yeah, it okay. easier to clean. It stops kind of things living in, in the cell there. And they, I mean, John's always careful and other, other producers I know are always careful to point this fact out that it's not sealing that the idea is that the wine still has contact with terracotta directly, and that terracotta has contact with the earth. Um, and they, you know, they're a big believer in that there, there needs to be this communication between the earth and the wine through through the terracotta. I mean, and sometimes you can taste that in in the wines as well. Yeah. You definitely, I mean, you, well, you can definitely taste terracotta. You know, not as strong as you would taste, say, like oak when oak is used mm. in <laughs> in wine that you know that we know in classic European styles that we replicate here in Australia, but but you know, definitely you can taste the terracotta character and you can also taste, you know, there's an earthiness sometimes which um, you know, which is coming coming from the soil. Yep, yep. And would you say there's an, an element of, of um, being like a slightly porous vessel where there's an element of, of oxygen contact as well during, during ferments or is it fairly shut uh, off? It would be a lot less than, say, a French oak barrel okay, sitting, right, sitting right. in a winery that's yeah. surrounded by air because, you, you know, you've got very little... Mm -hmm air or very little gas full stop in, in mm. the soil mm -hmm. but but definitely the potential for it yeah yep. yep. yeah that's fascinating um i cannot get enough of that wine it's it's really really cool it's wild but it's so yeah. styling and it's it's just so moorish it's really it, yeah beautiful yeah tang to it mm. on the finish mm. like it says builds a kind of succulence it's, it's kind of you know in the acidity both, you know, there's there's volatile acidity here at play, but mm -hmm. both of the that and the natural acidity is really kind of mouthwatering. Yeah, totally. And playing up against, like you said, you, you do get that influence of, of terracotta, which I would always describe as almost like chalky or mineral yep. in, in a wine. It's a lovely mineral. Playing in that, well. that backbone. This, this vineyard, um, or where this vineyard is, um, is, is situated over limestone. So mm -hmm. for me, this has quite like what I call a classic minerality at least for me you know i import a lot of french wines mm -hmm. as well so i'm quite used to working with wines grown on limestone and how that minerality is quite pronounced and and i actually see sort of similarities yeah. with, with this you know yeah totally um, just in terms of that that element yeah it's awesome um red yeah let's do it all right so this the second is, one of the, yeah, yeah no you introduce it please well, this, well, I have, the second one of the night is the well, that we sent out was the dorimi saparavi 2017 so same vintage um I mean, I, I, I feel as though, at least on my end, it's just not like, a, like a, it's not somewhere like um, the Yarra Valley or Burgundy where there's, you know, 20 different vintage reports on Imeretti or Kaketi, uh, that sort of thing. So I, I you know, I almost want to go, oh, well, you know, 2017 in, in, What's in the vintage like? what was that like? I think at this stage it doesn't yeah. really matter. No, I mean, no. these wines are also <laughs> so, so new and kind of interesting yeah. to us anyway. Um, uh, definitely, I do see a lot of vintage variation in, in the mm. Georgian wines. There's no doubt about that. Um, they, they, they do vary pro probably, you know, much more than we see in Australia. But I think like in Australia, you know, we try and ameliorate vintage conditions or mm. the expression of vintage conditions mm. in wine. And I think maybe you know, somewhere like Georgia, they actually 
there, but probably have a course of view, which is quite different. They probably go the other way and want to accentuate. What right, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is. The 17 um, was um, fairly good years, quite a bit of hail in some regions, particularly in Kaheti, but I don't know that either of these wines were affected um, mm -hmm. in particular. Um, but we're moving now with this wine over to Kaheti. So this is actually near, um, whereas this is Kartli um, from Pheasants Tears, this is Kaheti. So they're probably the two main regions. Kaheti is by far and away the much, much bigger region. There's a river called the Alazani, which eventually flows down into um, uh, into Azerbaijan and, and I think the, the Caspian Sea too um, in, in eastern Georgia. And that's where sort of on this plain, this river plain is where the bulk of, of um, you know, of wine growing happens in Georgia, certainly where the big end, big end of the industry mm. is. Um, you know, it's and it's a very dry, hot continental a climate, much like many of our Australian regions. Mm. Um, the you know the, we, we would definitely recognise the the climatic conditions there. Um, and Savarabi, I mean, as a variety, needs no introduction. It's pretty famous um, in Georgia as their main red variety, but it's actually one that's travelled. To Australia, so courtesy mm. of a Georgian winemaker who's been working over here for twenty odd years, um, he definitely bought Savarabi. It's, I mean, I haven't spoken personally with um, with him. I don't even know whether he's still in the country, but um, it's rumoured that he's brought Riccatelli as well. But I've, I've okay. never, I've never seen it mm. anywhere. So I don't, I don't know if someone does have it. If someone does have it, and anyone knows about it, please let me know. Because <laughs> I'd love to know about it. Um, I'd love to discover it one day. I see but, a yeah. little bit of Saparavi coming out now around there, Australia there and Victoria yeah, and yeah, the Granite Belt. And... We must be heading up to, I reckon, 20-odd um, commercially available examples of, of, okay. of Ride or Saparavi in Australia. It's definitely um, something which, you know, people have been interested in. I'm not quite sure why, um, uh, why the kind of interest has developed mm. in Saparavi in Australia. Maybe because it's potential to produce that kind of big red that we sort of talked about earlier. Yeah, yeah. But, that Australia um, you know, has traditionally had had a you know a real love affair with, um, and that's the style which has been made in Georgia and predominated as well, particularly in Kaheti, this this warmer area in eastern Georgia. Um, that said, uh, a lot of the kind of people that I work with are moving moving away from that now, uh, and I think you know it's partly the influence of um, I guess or well, maybe not the influence, but it's, you know sort of the the feedback coming in from the rest of the world, and and the and maybe the influence of people traveling and seeing, you know, the lighter styles of <laughs> reds that are popular, um, particularly amongst the natural wine movement, which most of these wines are, um, are you know, um, are moving within those circles. So Saparavi can be quite a formidable variety, and as, as you've got it open with you tonight, you can see that. I mean, this is it's kind of lightish, but it's not. I mean, it's not a rosé wine or. Light, light by sort of no you know by by I, those standards um it's, and it's still very much a red wine yeah and red fleshed i believe as well it's uh it's a uh, tonturia grape variety right. yeah. yeah i never remember what that was. Um, I, don't, I don't know where that comes from it sounds yeah. like sort of an ancient um uh, family of french royals or yeah. something but um uh, yeah it means that the the flesh is actually red as well <laughs> but but um uh, where i was going at when i was kind of touching about color um sort of this is not made traditionally with a, you know, sort of two, three, four week maceration ferment like we would make a red wine. And like people are doing it here in Australia and you produce really formidable wines, like massive tannins. Um, and you've got to think, you know, we talked about before, you know, this is where the vine came out of the wild and was first domesticated. So these varieties, these endemic varieties are closer genetically to wild varieties than anything else. Um, and if you know anything about sort of farming grapes today, you know that that the varieties we work with today are incredibly susceptible to mildew and all sorts of diseases and blights. Um, you know, they're actually quite delicate things. They would not survive in the forest. These are varieties which have survived in the forest. Um, you know, so, and, and a, a lot of them reflect that when they're, you know, when they're in the glass as finished wines as well. They're wild, they're rustic. In this case, you know, they have incredible, um, incredible tannins, you know, anthocyanins um, for colouring as well. Um, but this is only 10 hours skin contact. Yeah, okay, so right. in Australia, yeah. we would usually, you know, a rosé would get mm. maybe 10 hours yeah. um, from, um, from from most of our varieties that we, we work with. And we've actually got quite, it's quite a deeply, mm. darkly uh, coloured variety. It's not sort of definitely not dense in colour, mm. but the hue is actually quite, quite dark and quite rich. What I'm like 
really impressed with this wine is it it comes out not not like brutish, but it comes out quite quite powerful on the nose. And the palate's a completely different experience. Yeah. It's it's so like soft and plush and gentle and, and think, um, really yeah. silky with that natural acid. It's amazing. I think um, this is a beautiful example of the variety and, mm. and we've got others which are sort of carbonic. So made like Beaujolais with a three week carbonic maceration, um, which are really interesting as well. This is the the essence of, of the delicious flavor of Saccharabian mm. that they've managed to extract without any of the kind of formidable extraction of, of tannin and structure um, and even, you know, the kind of, you know, inky colour. Um, so, yeah, they've, they've kind of extracted all the beautiful elegance out of the wine mm. and, and all the fruit. And it's intense. Mm. I mean, it's, it's bloody delicious. Yeah. And there's so much going on in this wine. And this this is a, you know, it's got a level of fruit. It's more on the fresh fruit spectrum, yeah. certainly fresher than, than the amber style. Um, you know, this is more like a style we would recognise in Australia. Totally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, you um, know, not too... Not too far removed from Grenache or Gamay or something like that with that, totally, that, that totally. body. I think, yeah. yeah, I think, you know, when you think about Bross and Grenache and McLaren Val Grenache, I think you're probably, you're, um, you're in this sort of spectrum. Mm. Here you've got a bit more freshness, so more mm. natural acidity, mm. and I'm pretty sure you'll find that, um, well, no, with 13%, so, you know, mm. but, you know, 13 in, in South Australia for Grenache is, is pretty, that, that's, yeah. Yeah, that's on, on the money. lower spectrum. Totally. Usually, yeah. Um, and this, this producer, I then mean, I know, I knew John's story a little bit from, from hearing you talk um, about it previously. I don't know the Dorimi story too well. So uh, original, originally three three friends. Um, I don't know a lot of background about them, but I, I think it's classic, like um, like quite a few of our producers seem to be sort of, you know, intellectuals from Tbilisi who, you know, obviously have, um, you know, as I said before, everyone's got this family tradition of making wine. Um, so they, you know, they want to kind of turn that into something, uh, into a little um, enterprise. Uh, so they have a little Marani, which is just outside the capital. It's in, um, you know, in, in, a, in a friend's backyard, essentially. So land can be a little bit scarce in Georgia because, um, you know, post, obviously the Soviets didn't allow people to have much land. And then post um, Soviet, the land was all carved up as well. So, you know, even if you were, you know, pre-Soviet, a large traditional landowner, you didn't get that back. You know, you got a very small small parcel um i'm not exactly sure how it's carved up but um so yeah so they've got a, a marani there they're buying fruit from a couple of different regions uh in this case it's the fruit sourced from kaheti um but it's i think it's, it is really interesting and it's classic that there's this sort of you know this there's, there's a fairly healthy band of intellectuals in Tbilisi. it's a very civilized population um they are very cultured uh you know pre pre soviets and you know kind of late 1800s um you know Tbilisi was was a very important city in the world um very expensive very cultured you visit it today it's a bit like um you know it's a bit like a sort of slightly decaying paris uh, it's got all these beautiful old old buildings from that era as well as a few you know kind of um, you know, brutalist structures yeah, from yeah. the Soviet <laughs> era as well. But it's it's quite a beautiful city to to wander around. I haven't been to Buenos Aires, but I imagine it's much like sort of, you know, they, they kind of describe that as the Paris of um, South America. Um, but, you know, maybe a bit like that was. But, um, yeah, it's, it's – but there's also, you know, this – when I go and meet people, the sort of people I meet and the kind of jobs they do, and they're all into – you know, these are meeting people through wine. Yeah, most of the people in my wine industry are, you know, pretty, you know, pretty relaxed and you know, mm. kind of just wanted to take a different direction. But you know, these people actually have, you know, they're, yeah, they're, they're usually a solid band of, uh, you know, intellectuals mm. and creatives. Uh, and I think that's the case um, here with, with Do Re Mi. So, so now it's it's actually come back to just being um, Mamuka Sikuli, um, who's actually driving it. Um, so it's just kind of one one person as opposed to the three three friends that started it. So he's decided to carry it on as his full time thing. Uh, again, a lot of people, you know, making these small projects as as a second, uh, you know, second business for them. Yeah, I think that's that's kind of cool. I mean, it's um, you know thinking about the the, the Georgian wine industry and um, like I said, I think it would almost certainly be in a very different place if not for the Soviet era, which I believe was quite heavily affected. Um, well, we, but, we, we probably, yeah, we probably have a lot. We're probably be drinking a lot of Georgia. Right yeah, we wouldn't be sitting here talking about it. We'd, just, we'd all be drinking it. Exactly, maybe. yeah. Um, but also I think that concept of negotiant producers is really cool. 
like to to think of maybe it's not just I mean I, I think the story of the the producers on the vineyards and the land is is really special but also like you said these these um you know intellectuals from from the big cities a lot much like we're seeing here in Australia and have for a long time is you know passionate maybe young energetic individuals it, like putting themselves into such a historic wine production uh, scene is is really cool yeah and not, not not the first thing I'd think of when I think of Georgian wine yeah 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 no for sure so uh, then, yeah I think you know the the idea of the negotiation thing or you know mm. kind of buying fruit to um to make wine it's it's a bit out of necessity as I said before you know it's um you know it's quite difficult to come across sort of you know large parcels of vineyard most of I guess those uh you know post-Soviet wineries would have gone and, and you know they probably started and now form the really modern large brands of which there are a few that come out of Georgia you know they required a different level of wealth um, to, to kick off so it's quite interesting that a lot of these um, producers have and we were talking you know we're importing people that make less than a thousand bottles of wine I mean it's pretty extraordinary mm. um, one that um, people can do that and actually you know want to bottle it and put a label on it and eat it literally it just sounds like making wine at home to me it's, it's a minuscule quantity really really tiny um but then to actually have it you know all the way over here in australia is, is just magic for us cool. to get our 36 <laughs> bottles or our 60 bottles a year um is you know is, is quite beautiful uh and there's i mean it goes without saying that you know with wine con comes hospitality and the georgians are the are the most hospitable people that, that yeah. i've come across um in all my kind of working in the wine world um, yeah, in, in, incredible. So there's no such thing as a quick tasting in Georgia and whipping in. It's, it's all, you know, you come, you stay, you eat, you drink. Yeah. I think that's totally worth mentioning. And uh, like like you said, I think um, said incredibly hospitable. And I, I, from what I understand, the food culture is pretty unbelievable as well yeah, in how good. they eat and how they drink and, and, and welcoming and stuff. Yeah. yeah. I mean, food, uh, Georgia, you know, Georgia was the fruit bowl of, of the USSR, mm. you know, being um, sort of, like, I think it probably was the most southerly country, but the climate there, not only, um, I mean, it's a small country, it's only sort of 450k east to west, and I don't know, maybe, you know, maybe a couple, couple of hundred or 250 north to south, depending on which, which edge of the country you're in, and, and you're bordered by, you've got the, you know, in the north, you've got the, um, the Caucasus Mountains, the greater Caucasus, and the, mm. And the, the lesser in the bottom in the south. Um, but there's a huge range of climates from the Black Sea, um, you've got sort of you know subtropical all the way through to Kaheti in the mm. so that's in the west and in the, in the east, where we've been talking about where it's continental and dry and hot. So they grow a huge range of stuff. So the biggest export today is nuts. You know, wine yeah. wine is um is a decent size mm. export for them, but they're traditionally an agricultural country. Mm. Yeah. So a lot of fresh food, but you know, these things we talked about, vegetables, mm. nuts. The food, uh, the cuisine is, you know, it's relatively simple, not sort of a simple, say, Italian stuff, but mm. um, they use spices a lot, being on that silk route, that's been a huge influence for them. Um, but a, a lot of kind of, yeah, a lot of, a lot of fresh flavours. It's mm. quite healthy. There's a lot of vegetarian food as well. So, it's, you know, it's great for, for vegetarians, great country to travel in. Oh, yeah, yeah, cool. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, no, this is, this is awesome. Like, I, I, between both of these, I've just felt that sense of Moorishness in there. That kind of like, you know, you can kind of picture those big lunches or big dinners, yep. or, or like you're mentioning. Um, this is just yeah. it. This, yeah. this is a little less wild. I mean, you know, as I said before, it's just a bit more primary. So mm. Mm. it's really kind of you know succulent mm. kind of plum and cherry characters, and I think you said you know gamay and, and yep. Beaujolais. Yep. It's like a sort of dark, darker mm. expression of that. There's a little bit, a little bit of spritz in the mm. wine, which comes with you know sort of natural wine making mm. and, and no or low sulfur as well. But um, it's super delicious and mm. very little tannin, which can be a, an issue for, mm. for young Saparabi. Yeah, I think the the way they've made it this year is is it's just delicious. Yeah, I smashed it. Yeah. Um, I had a few other questions as well, sort of before we finished up on mm. what the, I thought has been an amazing little little chat there. But um, I know you've been importing uh, Georgian wine into Australia for a little while. How have you sort of seen the attitude and, and perception of Georgian wine change from a, an Australian, I guess, mindset and palate selling to restaurants and people like myself and, and that kind of thing over the years? 
Um, I think it's, yeah, it's good. It's definitely still developing. Mm. There's, there's, a, there's, there's a lot of education to be done. And, and, you know, thank you for your attention and for watching this tonight because it's, it's really, really important that we get a chance to convey information about these wines because they are so different. You know, it's all different varieties, a different part of the world. Um, yeah, and, then, and definitely different characters that we're tasting. But um, I, I think it's it's developing, and we you know we have a lot of feedback, um, both from restaurants and and from retail as well. That you know people are coming in off the street and they say, "I want to try Georgian wine." So it tells me that when when someone is trying it for the first time, or you know, maybe repeatedly, they're talking about it. And they're, mm-hmm. you know, they are you know spreading the word, and then there's a little bit you know there's, the interest is is kind of developing. Certainly in the in the on premise scene, so with restaurants. Um, you know, we're seeing some good supporters there who, you know, who make a point to have a selection of Georgian wines on their list, which, you know, because we have a very, very big range, they can kind of rotate things in and out. There might be just a few bottles now and then they move on to something else, et cetera. But, um, and, and, but they're working, you know, people want, people want something new. They want something different. Um, and I think, you know, as I said before about the idea of authenticity and, and this history that, that's wrapped up in the Georgian thing as well. And they're just quite unlike anything else. Um, that's, it's, it's actually proving, you know, it's kind of, you know, it's popular in a very, very niche kind of way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a, more a crack than a niche. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, we're slow, we're in there and we, you know, we're kind of trying to get the elbows mm. out and, and, and widen it all the time and, and introduce more people to these, these styles of wine. So. It's, it's slowly happening. It just it just kind of ticks over. Um, I mean, for us, I guess you know, it'd be interesting one day to you know to get the wines online and, and have that educational resource there mm-hmm. for people and see you know see what the feedback is that way. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. No, I think it'd be awesome. I I, I have a lot of faith in in you know my customers and, yeah. and customers of the Oak Barrel and just, just general wine consumers in Australia in general. That like I think we touched on earlier. I don't know if, if it went live or not, but I feel like we're shocked but not scared when it when it comes to like some of these takes and like Absolutely. certainly not something like this i feel like this could go and sit amongst any sort of european or even new world red wine degustation and be completely in its in its own yeah um and it's sing like it is now but um yeah i feel like we've we've got a, a bit of a hunger for it and you know, yeah. that's how it feels to me which exactly. i think is I really mean, cool. the, you know there's a whole generation of wine drinker coming through now um you know, unlike me, you know, coming through sort of, you know, wine shows and mm. traditional structure and learning, you know, everything you know about through sort of European classics and that mm. kind of stuff, who we are coming up from a very different angle, you know, mm. the, it's the it's the craft beer and craft spirits and, you know, essentially kind of, you know, natural wine and they're mm. just, um, just diving kind of straight in. And they, you know, they really, you know, really want something which is a bit more challenging and mm. a bit more interesting. Yeah, I mean, their, their mind is, is, is really quite open for wines like, like these, so. I mean, the, the only thing, obviously, that holds it back a little bit is, you know, these are not $20 retail wines. They're, yeah. You know, they're $40, $50, $60 retail wines. But, um, you know, when you understand how they're made and the rarity of them, they're actually incredible value compared to, yeah, say, absolutely. the rarity um, of, you know, of traditional Western European wines. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's a wonder that they're not, you know, they're not kind of more expensive. And, 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 I mean, there is a bit of, there is quite a bit of pressure on price. And I know that, the producers we're working with are selling out quicker and quicker every year um you know to the point where it's yeah if, if we're not there on the ground straight away then then we kind of miss out yeah, yeah which is the other thing i mean like i said it's, it's not just us that have a thirst for it it's no you way. know I mean, america the, most yeah. of europe like laps it up and yeah i mean you know a lot of tra- traditional natural wine um markets um you know it's, yeah like new york and london and you know, even in France, you know, mm. the French are traditionally very reticent about anything other than French wine, mm. um, but they've, they've adopted them. But yeah, I mean, Japan mm. would buy the entire production of all, all the producers. Really? Food, I think. You know, yeah. other than maybe Fessence Tears, who are, mm. who are lot, much larger than anyone else that's um, that we're working with. Mm. Yeah, but no, they have a huge appetite. And, and, and it's that history and authenticity. I mean, it just... It just works so perfectly with the Japanese aesthetic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, and and food amazing. as well, I assume, right? Like Absolutely. The, I mean, yeah. Umami. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> amber wine and umami. Yeah, Whoa. yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. I actually didn't know that. So that's, yeah, yeah that's, that's no, really, really interesting. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, yeah it's a big, 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 big thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, the last question that I had, yeah. as we've well and truly blown our little hour mark out, but that's fine. People will, will have hope. We'll keep watching. Um, was that. 
Um, I think a little while ago we were tasting together and, and you sort of mentioned to me um, briefly about the, maybe being a bit more of a new wave or a, a, um, a, more, a mindset in Georgian winemaking to just clean it up ever so slightly to maybe appeal to a bit more of an export market and yeah. maybe just a bit more of a, uh, uh, I can't I think of the word, but a serious approach to the winemaking, if that makes yeah. sense. Is, is that something yeah, yeah. that you're still kind of seeing and maybe a, a yeah, bit definitely. more of a... Um, and importance on producing wines that are, you know, taste really good, you know, um, represent the culture really well, but also are very clean and, and can put them on the map a little bit more. Yeah, I, I think definitely, um, you know, the uh, Georgia has been very outward looking, you know, sort of post USSR culturally, um, and that's, you know, led them to, to, you know, to find the natural wine world, and they brought a lot of feedback back into that. So that's that's kind of influenced their styles. I mean, it's definitely influenced, well, not influenced, but it's definitely reinforced that they're on the right track to start with because it's, you know, traditional Georgian wine is natural wine. Mm. They wouldn't use heavy processes. They don't fine or filter or, you know, or put additives in the wine and, and they normally wouldn't use sulfur at all. That's just not, you know, not, not something they would do, um, uh, you know, for, for this kind of, you know, home winemaking style. And then, um, you know, with the, the Renaissance, obviously Renaissance, you know, you're starting, you're starting from, um, from a, a lower level. And you know, as I said, you know, these are people who may have not, you know, may have made good, good quality wine but never bottled it before and have sort of started to look to the next level and bottled it and it's gone to the city and then, you know, finally gets discovered and, and sort of goes to export. So, <clears throat> and definitely it's been incentive for them, not only feedback but also investment as well. It's like, oh, okay, shit, you know, I can actually do something with this. You know, I can make a, make a go of this. Um, so I think that's fed back in into the absolute quality of the wine and, and, um, and definitely... Um, the rusticity uh, and maybe some of the kind of you know really glaring faults in some of the some of the early wines um, mm -hmm. are starting to disappear. Um, you know, not completely, but you know, we with us we've got someone on the ground, so we you know sort of try and um, you know we try and work to produce you know try and work to um, to make sure we got a portfolio of styles which are applicable to the you know to the market mm -hmm. that you know you and I uh, are, are all going to enjoy. Um, so they, they definitely are improving. And I, I think, you know, the feedback in terms of, you know, the sharing of knowledge of winemaking as well. Um, although, you know, making wine in a quiver is pretty unique, mm. but there are some, you know, fundamental winemaking principles, which, you know, which if not followed will result in, in issues for you as mm. well. So I think, yeah, I, I think they're definitely cleaning the wines up. And I, oh, look, I think this, you know, this Saparavi, okay, yeah. I mean, this... Yeah, exactly. the, the pheasant's tears is not a good example of what we're talking about. That's going mm. the other way. I mean, they're really pushing the boat out. They mm. want to make wild wines. Um, you know, they, they want shock, like mm. you said. Um, but this Saparavi is just just downright delicious. And we've got a range of styles now. I mean, you know, in Georgia traditionally, you know, from what I understand, it's a white wine, so no maceration, um, which is traditional in Western Georgia, maybe so in Mareti region. Uh, and then the amber wines like we had tonight, uh, and then there's then there's you know, then there's red wine, mm. and there's the semi-sweet red wine in commercial industry, but mm. no one would make that at home. Um, today, you know, they produce pet gnats. Mm. You know, pet gnat is not traditional natural Georgian style, although it's an ancient technique. Not intentionally. It's not that yeah, ancient. Yeah, 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 not intentionally. <laughs> you're right. Exactly. And this is something which has come directly back from the you know natural wine world. Mm. There's rosé. Oh, we've got some amazing you know sort of um, light reds on the on the verge of mm. rosé at the mm. moment, which are just just so smashable and that's not a word that you know you would traditionally associate with these traditional traditional styles mm. so yeah so the styles are opening up the quality is improving so you know the, the container that we that we landed this year in february the quality is just you know it's a huge leap on from anything we've had previously yeah and that's happening incrementally so yeah it's great i think that's fantastic so um yeah, i think it's important as well you know for people to have confidence in the wines that they're you know they're going to get something that that isn't just just pure shock value, which yeah, yeah. you know is not something that you want on a Tuesday night. Let's face it, you'll you know maybe a bit of fun with friends on a Saturday, um, but yeah. So to you know to make styles which yeah which are I guess a bit more globally appealing, totally yeah, without yeah, losing yeah. their soul though. That's yeah. that's important. Yeah, no, I I, I agree with with what I've tried. Um, 
recently. I think, yeah, yeah it's, things just sharp enough. I mean, they're Definitely. producers that I'm super keen on um, that are all yours, obviously, but I think Archil Gunyava, yeah. uh, yes. Enek yes. Peterson, yeah. um, a bunch of others. But, uh, yeah, just clean and, and yeah. super. And, and like, I think as, as a retailer, it's, it's um, like really awesome for me to be able to stand there and go, yeah, take it home, drink it, enjoy it. You know, yeah. love it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, it's, it's just nice to have, you know, have these styles which, um, you know, are not kind of just for the diehards mm. and the hardcore, you know, that can cross over into people that, you know, okay, well, you know, we normally drink Grenache. Oh, mm. great. Try this 17 Saparabi from Georgia. Yeah. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, try it. You'll like it. Mm. And, and people will. Mm. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Oh, love it. Love it. Yeah, it's, it's looking really, really good. Um, and I hope everyone there that is enjoying it, whether it's right now, whether it's on the, this weekend, whenever you're watching this back is, is also loving it as well. Um, mate, that's it for all my questions. And I've learned a lot. Yeah, good. Today, well, so, yeah, yeah. It's been great. Great spending yeah, yeah. time with you and having a discussion. It was and, good fun. Thanks for tuning in as well. Yeah. Um, and any questions you've got about Georgian wines? Buy them off to Joe and pick answer them. <laughs> yes. He'll ask me. Send them to me and I will just forward them, them straight to Tim. Well, if um, I don't know, I'll ask George. Yeah, which yeah. is really good. Um, <laughs> but yeah, obviously yourself, um, Venice uh, here in Australia is, is sort of the go-to, um, the, the, my go-to for, for wholesale, but um, pretty much they're on the, on the front foot of everything amazing Georgian wine happening in, in the country. So mate, thank you so much for coming thank down. You. It's yeah. it's it's a pleasure. Um, and this uh, will obviously be going up right now. We're going up on YouTube, the Oprah website, Facebook. Um, that's it, I think. Yeah. Fantastic. Mate, cheers, Gamajos. mate. Yeah. Gamajos. Uh, yeah, and that's also, well, I was actually thinking, if, I don't think there was any cha-cha available, but. Um, no, 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 I've got half a bottle at home, but that's, <laughs> yeah. that's tricky for personal use. I was thinking um, there, there is the uh, the Georgian grappa as well, which uh, uh, John makes at Pheasant's Tears, which um, we, we're looking. We're, I was thinking about including into the packs, but unfortunately, there, there was none left in the country. Yeah. Um, uh, probably due to my. It travels pretty well in, in small quantities, yeah, which yeah. is nice. But yeah. yeah. That might have something to do with both of our personal consumption of the stuff. But anyway. That's yeah. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. 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 That, that is for the diehards. That's for sure. Beauty. Well, guys, um, thank you all for tuning in um, tonight uh, and wherever you're watching it. And um, yeah, I hope we all have a great time. And like I said, um, we also uh, were a really small little bottle shop here so um you know losing the events in the year was, was a big deal but it's been amazing to sort of keep these up keep these going and um the the support from the the customer end has been phenomenal um so looking forward to doing heaps more of it come the new year so thank you guys Cheers out. Cheers.